Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton, Armin Shimmerman, Melissa Longo, and Ryan T. Esk. So where did we leave off? I don't quite recall, but there's a lot more 1992, to I think. <laughs> yeah, it was 92, yeah. Yeah. Melissa's birthday, January 3rd, 1993, That's which means this was shot in 1992, no doubt. Oh, Armin, do you remember... <laughs> Was this more than a two-week shoot? It really, when I was watching it, it really felt like there's no way to cram all this in two weeks. Uh, I think it was two weeks. Uh, wow. It, it, it could have been, I don't think it was more than two weeks. I think it was two weeks. And, and one of the things that you haven't touched upon, there's no reason why you should. But, you know, during half of that shoot, we didn't uh, have the trill yet. We didn't have the DAX. Um, so we were shooting and we we're all saying, well, when do we get the Dax actress? And they hadn't cast her yet. They hadn't cast mm -hmm. her yet. One thing so that I first. thought for sure, as, as far as like the timing of the shoot, I remember my, my first thought when seeing the, the enterprise was that that's some of their first days. Cause I would think production wise, they're still building the deep space nine set, but the next generation set is wide open maybe they're on uh you know the christmas holiday break or something like that it's maybe earlier mid-december or something like that you shoot that first you shoot the exterior while people are building the deep space nine set no we that that set was was finished at least the promenade mm. uh i can't tell you about ops but but the promenade which was sound stage seven was completely finished wow and uh it i don't know about ciroc but i felt about ciroc's age uh, when I walked <laughs> onto the set, uh, because it was incredible, it was humongous. It, it was humongous. humongous, and it was it was totally out of this world, and 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 gorgeous, gorgeous, and everything about every little thing had been finished by the time that I stepped on stage for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it it unlike TNG or other shows, I've worked on a lot of shows. Everything's in a, you know, a little, it's cut off. It's a little piece here, a little piece there. Little, and, and you, and you, the camera moves and, and doesn't show you that there's an interruption between one piece to the next. But on Deep Space Nine, everything was there just as you saw it on the screen. The distance from Quark's bar to Odo's office was exactly the same for seven years. Incredible. And, and you walked there. I mean, it, it was, it was an e-ride from Disney. It was, it was gorgeous and wonderful. And, and uh, uh, as I've said many, many times, I, I felt like I had won the lottery because I was a huge Star Trek fan. And so to actually be on, on a completed set. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, they said that was the largest like single set built on a soundstage uh, till that point, at least. It was. Uh, there was there's nothing, I'm not, even after Deep Space Nine, I've rarely been on sound stages that were as complete and huge and like that. I mean, I mean, the soundstage is huge, and every inch of it, except a little, you know, mm -hmm. passageways behind the set, uh, was taken up by the set. So, and they must have put millions of dollars of construction into that set. And that was just the promenade. They still had to create ops and and uh, some of the other uh, places that they used. Boy, to be yeah, on that two, set. Two stories, <laughs> yeah. too, by the way. Yeah, two stories, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I mean, no. when you sat there with Aaron with your legs hanging over the, you know, yeah. hanging over the the, the second story. Uh, that was wasn't that, that wasn't green screen. That <laughs> no. was, that was, yeah. that was yeah. real. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'd been on one set only that was comparable to that, and that was the first G.I. Joe movie. It was the, the, the giant sound stages in Paramount uh in Downey. There's like different Paramount and Downey. And it was three floors, 360 degrees, yeah. certain details that a camera would never pick up 100 feet out. So I can only imagine this is the same thing, even more mm -hmm. so with Deep Space Nine, because the camera will pick it up at some point, whether it's season four, episode five. At some point, they will be shooting almost every nook and cranny of that station. Right. We had a third story to Quark that was hardly ever used, but it was there from day one. Really a third story? I remember one episode where they they, they had us up there. We had to go up there and shoot. And I thought, I didn't even know that place existed. It had always been there. <laughs> but we had to climb up to that third story uh, to do something, um, look down on the bar. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, they, they they did a phenomenal job of construction 
and and as Sirach and everybody else knows, um, um, the Akudas would leave little notes for us that every now and then you'd look down and there'd be a, a, a little snippet of something written on, and the Akudas had left some sort of message for the actors and the crew. Like what? Like blocking or just something sweet? No, no, like no, Happy no, just, Tuesday. Just, um, um, <laughs> My favorite one, and it doesn't apply to this first episode, but uh, there was the Far Beyond the Stars where I was um, playing a character that wasn't Quark. And on my desk, uh, it said, and the character's name was Herb. It it was supposedly a note from uh, the boss of the character that Renee was playing. Uh, It said, Herb, the idea of a teenager slaying vampires just won't work. <laughs> when I happened to note, I mean, it wasn't obvious. I'm, I'm doing something <laughs> while the camera's getting ready. And I looked down and there's an Akuda note. And I went, oh, that's funny. That's funny. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I used to spend time in between shots going up to the panels and just trying to read what was in secretly what encoded read, in the yeah. back. Yeah, whose name was whose name was really in there? Was, you know, so they you left find Easter eggs name. for the That's actors. So cool. Yeah, well, not just for the actors. <laughs> for the crew it was just yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for themselves, eggs. really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But uh, we would catch it because we were there long enough. You stand on the set and you're looking around. You're like, hey, what does that say, anyways? And you look at the plaque or you look at something, and you and then you'll see that it actually says something completely hilarious <laughs> yeah, there's a plaque somewhere in, on the sound stage of the promenade it was a metal plaque and i actually checked it out one day and it was all the producers names were written on the plaque <laughs> uh which i i kind of liked as well exactly yeah they and even all of the set designers they had so many people in there that were credited in those panels and those instrument panels that were all the guys in the back back end doing all the stuff off camera. So I'm glad that secretly they have their 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 kudos all in, inside of the paneling. But I did like the fact that you know Quark took a big stand about he didn't like being called the thief. You know, I'm a gambler, fine, admitted, <laughs> but I'm not man. a thief. You know, I'm a hustler. I might hustle you. I might finagle a few things. But I'm not a full out all you know all out thief, and I I like that to me also showed that Quark stands on some principles that he's not. There's no. It's not like there's no limit to which where he'll go. There's limits. He, he he does care about his image, for example. He doesn't want to be perceived as that. Thank you for that. I and I will go one step further and say uh, I thought Quark, and this is coming from the actor who played Quark, that he was one of the more ethical people on the show. And it may not have been human ethics, right? Right. But we did have the rules of acquisition, and yes, you can go so far, but but there are rules, and and uh, you're allowed to do certain things that perhaps the humans don't agree with, but it was okay for the ethos of of that particular species. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he tried to follow those as best he could. That's why he spouted the rules so often. Is that those were his Ten Commandments. That's also so, why he was so conflicted as such a conflicted character was because he tried to follow the laws of his particular culture to a T and become successful and good in, in their value system. But he was also conflicted because these humans and all these others were convincing him to do other things that also kind of felt right sometimes. Right. Uh, if I may, I, I remember being influenced by something that I heard Patrick Stewart say, not on Star Trek, long before he ever heard of Star Trek, mm. uh, when he was a young man, probably about 26 years old, on a um, um, a um, TV show out of out of BBC called Mastering Shakespeare, where he had played Shylock. And he said uh, he, he was a character who had his own rules of ethics, but was living amongst a lot of foreigners. This is Shylock in that play. And he has to, just as what you said, Ryan, he has his own ethics from the way he was brought up, but yet he's also being pulled by the ethics of, of the foreign alien society that he's living in. And I remember thinking that is a, that is a great, yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, that is a great uh, thing for me to follow what, as I played Quark, which was your own eth- ethos, but being 
influenced by the people you're living with. Um, that, that the scene in Quark's bar uh, when the Cardassians are getting rowdy and Kira shuts down everything and says this, this bar is now closed. Something popped into my head wondering, um, was Quark in on that? Because Yeah, he, he had to be in on that. Yeah. He's not going to let all that gold go out of the door. He's well, getting wow, that gold nice back. Theory. And, and he handed... <laughs> I thought the same thing. He handed Odo to them. So he, they, yeah. he was essential in helping to plant Odo on the Cardassian he, There's ship, no way so. he's not. He's going to be used without him knowing. He's right. in on that. Yeah. Kira, Kira did not pull a fast one on him. There's I no cannot way. confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way. I, I was like, he's in on it. I'm like, he got that gold back. He went right to that. Right. There should have been a scene where it corks at the panel, opening that same panel. Well, and the, yeah, the way he was handling the last. <laughs> but he's not a thief, before. though. <laughs> not a thief. He's not a thief. No. Not a, but it belongs to me, so it's like I'm just retrieving stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> I, I let you touch it. Now I'm taking it back. Exactly. <laughs> I'll keep it here uh, for you I'll when you realize it's gone. Right here. Right. <laughs> right. Oh yeah, that was oh that was. Gosh. I thought the same thing, Melissa. I was like, yeah. Quark is totally in on this. He knows what's going on. He has um, to be in on it. He right? has to be. So, yeah, he has to be. But well, you know I what else? I, you, I will tell you, it wasn't until uh, about three or four episodes further on that I really discovered who Quark was. So I'm flying mm -hmm. by the seat of my pants. This is sort of why I asked Melissa about, about Aaron. Because in that first episode, yes, I was doing all the stuff that I auditioned with. But, um, but I didn't really know who the character was. I know I... I know what I didn't want to do. That was clear to me. I did not want to do the Ferengi I had played in Next Generation. I did not want to do that. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know who the character was. And it wasn't until, I um, can't remember which episode, but but um, I went, oh, this is who he is. Okay. So, so whatever you saw, it's still a fledgling plastic sort of performance as I'm figuring out. I mean... We we don't know who our characters are in in that in that first episode. I believe most of us, I won't say all of us, most of us are trying to flesh out the characters as we think the writers see them, mm -hmm. as the mm -hmm. the writers have the way we auditioned in order to get the the writers and the producers approval. But as as the as the episodes go on, I think we all begin to think of who are we, what are we doing. And we start to form our own ideas about the character, which may or may not uh, line up with the writers. I'm pretty sure my idea of what the court character should be and what the writers wanted the character to be was not the same. Um, but but eventually they had to put up with the actor that they had cast and had to follow as as best they could and still try to have their vision fulfilled mm -hmm. as well. Um, I wonder if I wonder if we could get you to remember when that aha moment was, because that would be really interesting. Was, I can tell you what it is. I just can't remember what the episode was. Mm -hmm. But I remember being in ops. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't on the promenade. It wasn't in the bar. Um, it was in ops. So the first time Quark appears in ops, mm -hmm. that would be the aha moment where I went, oh, that's who I am. I, re I remember that moment distinctly. I just can't remember the title of the episode. Wow. When we first see that episode coming up, and sometime in the next handful, yeah, we're going to know that. Yeah, the first time that my character is on ops, and he's looking is at it, a panel. Is it I remember looking at Babel? a panel. It might be. I was thinking oh, that, too. That's Babel. episode four, I think. Because I think that's the first time he's in ops because nobody else can understand each other. So They're speaking Odo gibberish. deputizes Quark to help him run the station. It might, it might be that one. Yeah, it could be. Uh, uh, but I just remember looking at that panel in ops, and all of a sudden, everything fell into place. It was an aha moment. I went, oh, that's who this character is. Mm -hmm. I got it. And then I felt very comfortable playing that version of myself that uh, I had conceived of mm -hmm. at that moment. In oh, fact, amazing. talking about the first episode, one thing that I remember quite distinctly, forgive me, was 
I used the voice that I had used for the Ferengi on 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 the other on the TNG episodes. So that um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Kira, and I said, um, uh, "I love a woman in uniform," and that's the way I played it, like that. And uh, when that episode was over, when the pilot was over, all of us, I'm assuming Sulak, you did too, you had to go into Berman's office and get notes. Uh, we did. All of us had to get notes. And um, and the first thing- I never, was, I never went, I never got notes though. So you I- You didn't have to go into I, Berman's office to get no, notes. We all no. did, the rest of us did. Um, they, were, they, weren't ter- uh, they weren't terrible notes. They were, in fact, this was a great note that he gave me. The first thing he said to me was, Armin, lose the voice. <laughs> now, we've already shot the pilot. Lose the voice. And I went, great, fine. And I'm grateful for that because he was absolutely right. Absolutely. Armin, do you, do you know if he said the same thing to Max? Because Max's voice absolutely changed pretty quickly. I don't know. I, I, I do know, as, as Melissa was saying about Aaron, that all of us were influenced by the last outpost, which Max told me once when he played Ferengi on Next Generation, they were sent, the actors playing Ferengi were sent the last outpost to see what a Ferengi was like. And as everyone knows, I've been apologizing for that episode ever since. <laughs> uh, but um, I don't know. I, I'll, next time I speak to Max, Ryan, I, I will ask him if he got that note. I know I did. And, and it was that quick. It was that quick. Thing, just- it, it, it was ahead. just lose the voice uh, real quick. Yeah, there was one other one other note, which uh, is funny in retrospect. But because of the teeth and because of the voice, I couldn't say commander. It it, it came out commander, commander. He said to me, I remember this distinctly. He said, Armin, we already have one Irishman on the show. We don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> Irishman, Ferengi, whatever. <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, Rick Bourbon is funny sometimes. Though. He can be funny. Yeah. He can be funny. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's hilarious. And um, I was so happy when, when Avery got promoted. <laughs> so I didn't have to say commander. Anymore. Yeah, no more commander. <laughs> commander. <laughs> uh, that was another thing I noticed watching the pilot was that um, it was kind of a Another element of the storyline was O'Brien saying goodbye to the next generation. It was a subtle kind yes. of rift in the background, but it was there. The moment was there. Picard, you know, had that kind of beam him out of the out of the uh, Enterprise onto Deep Space Nine type moment. And I thought, wow, this is kind of him moving from one show to another, and that that's. That's him, you know, taking the the, the baton over and, and carrying it over onto Deep Space Nine, and that was an element I didn't really pay that much attention to in the beginning. But in this uh, this watch, I noticed how much of the O'Brien storyline was kind of the handing over of Next Generation. Um, yeah, they were wise. They were very wise to do that because, uh, as we all know, Colin Meany is an incredibly phenomenal actor. Mm-hmm. And to see the rise of his character from TNG, from the first episodes that he was in in TNG to the series regular on Deep Space Nine, um, is uh, is a, is a um, a compliment to to Cullum's extraordinary talent. Uh, he was uh, he was rock solid from the very first day, and, and was always solid. And and how he did it, I'm going to tell him a little. I'm not going to tell you how he did it because I don't know how he did it. But I discovered <laughs> that he would come in for camera rehearsals and have no idea what his scene was about. <laughs> not whatsoever. <laughs> he hadn't read the script. He wasn't ready. And 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 he uh, he would he would just go to camera rehearsal, read the lines flatly, and then in the half an hour it took for them to light whatever scene that he was in, he would be brilliant when wow. he came back. I saw him wow. do that with my own eyes too. I've seen him many times, many times, not just once. I've seen him many times come into a blocking early morning with the minis in his hands and he's fumbling through it. <laughs> the mini, the donut minis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the, the miniature scripts. And then he'll oh, just okay. like, he'll, you know, no, he'll, he'll go through it. He'll read it and then, you know, fumble through it. 
and then like like Armin is saying, thirty minutes later, you're not, you don't have to worry about him. He's yeah, frightful. I would spend I would spend every moment of the, of the day when I got the script, whenever I got a new script, you know, thinking about what I was going to do, and and still not sure about what I was going to do when I was in front of the camera. Uh, and that would be 48 hours or so, but he would do all that in a half hour and, and, and yeah. not only have it, the decisions made, but have it memorized. He didn't know what the words were when he came in. Wow. <laughs> then he memorizes it as well as decisions. This is an extraordinary talent and, uh, yeah. and a quickness that, that is astounding. Sounds stressful for directors and producers. Maybe that's why Rick Berman mm. said, well, I already got one Irishman. I don't want to. No, no, I don't think that's the thing. <laughs> but, but, but it is, I, I don't think enough is said about Colin Meany. Uh, yeah. Since I, I understand when I'm on, we're focusing on other things because I didn't have that many scenes with Colin. But, um, but Colin Meany uh, is an extraordinary actor who should get more acclaim. Mm. God knows his career outside of Star Trek has been extraordinary. Uh, uh, one to be envied, but uh, and and rightfully so because he deserves it. He deserves mm -hmm. the the claim and the success that he's had. It's an extraordinary actor. You know, we only have a few yeah. minutes left, but I actually just remembered very quickly. Sorry, Sirach, did you have something you wanted to add to that before? I two the words: subject? easy yeah. and effortless. That's that's what I remember. It was easy for him, and it seemed effortless when you looked at him do it. It was just like lucky. He, he's like this guy is. You know, he just <laughs> right on point. And once he's got it, it's in. So um, I, I do remember that about Colin. He's an extraordinarily gifted actor and able to get it right in so little time. In mm -hmm. so little time. That's that. And, and may I ask about getting it right? On our show, even from the very first, uh, we had to say the words exactly as written on the page. Now, as a young man, Sirach, were you required to do that as well? Because obviously they could... They could sort of say to you, well, I guess you can fudge the words a little. But did you have to be a DLP as well? DLP, yeah. baby. No, they wanted that. Yeah, they, they were adamant about that. Um, and just in my own uh, OCD way, I want to remember things word for word. So, you know, I feel like you're not doing justice if you don't remember the script. So like, um, you know. My my entrance into the acting was doing the Martin Luther King speech and the I Have a Dream speech, and so was Adam into the get the I Have a Dream speech right. You're not gonna, you can't just can wing it. it. Yeah, yeah. You can't wing, wing it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dream and um, uh, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> and you were there, and you were there, and you were there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't wing it. It's gotta be. You gotta, you know, you gotta pay homage. So to me, I feel like. All of uh, acting should be approached with that kind of reverence that you respect the words that the writers put down or you respect the historic uh, historical meaning of speeches and uh, monologues or whatnot. So, yeah, I mm -hmm. think it's it's important to do it right. Now, there are certain times when I felt like sentences didn't sound right. Like I don't see myself form formatting a sentence in that way. Mm -hmm. And I would maybe reconstruct a sentence if it felt more comfortable to say it in this particular really, way. Really, I, I don't. Good, good for you. So they allowed me to do that because I know if I tried to do that, um, they would say no. Uh, you know, uh, Judy Brown, the script coordinator, would say that we have to do it again because it wasn't DLP. DLP, dead letter perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, Sirach's told us many a time about DLP. DLP, love <laughs> Yeah, uh, love you. That's what it is. Uh, that's what you yeah. wanted to hear. You, you didn't want to hear that's, that's, a, hear that's a print or anything. You wanted Judy to say <laughs> DLP. That means well, because have... Judy Judy had like essentially final say over whether a print uh, in a shot mm -hmm. got printed or not. So yeah, it might look great. The camera might be right. You know, the measurements are right. The, the focus was in. Everything. The sound was great. But then it would all hinge on Judy. And if Judy says, "Uh," and she would, you, you would always know because she would have. This, this, there would be this pause, and she's looking down at the script, and she would be like, Sirach, uh, uh, you said. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like, uh, as soon as you hear Sirach, you said, you're like, oh, God. <laughs> it's on me, isn't it? My fault. <laughs> but, but I think I think that need to get a DLP all the time was not only instructive for you and me, and the, but the others as well. So it was it, it was an inspiration to try to do the best you could, that you couldn't 
forgive me, you couldn't fuck around. You, you, yeah. you, you had to do it according to Hoyle and you had to do it as best you could. And, and because the cast, not only the main cast, but the supporting cast as well, were such phenomenally good actors that you just didn't want to look bad in comparison to them. Mm -hmm. Including yeah. yourself. Yeah. And, and, and so that was my, yeah, that's yeah. why, that's my entire experience is just being around great actors like yourself, great actors like Renee and Colm and Avery. And, and essentially, you just don't want to be the cause of the mess up. Like, you know, if we have to do it again, it's not because of me. That's right. that's it's basically right. playing the game of not it, like not it. <laughs> <laughs> and if I may, I think that's the, one of the criteria between the differences between the ethos on our show and the ethos, at least on the two shows that surrounded us. Mm. That both Next Generation and Voyage are wonderful shows in their own right had more fun mm. uh, doing their show because they could fool around. You know, they could fool around. Um, and, and I attribute this, a, a great deal of this to Avery. Um, as we all know, number one on the call sheet sets the tone, and Avery was number one on the call sheet. He set the tone for, we're going to, we're going to do our work and we're gonna do it as well as we possibly can. And all these elements fit into the ethos of doing the very best we could. So you can imagine our disappointment when we were all striving to do the very best we could, and yet we always felt for years that we were um, considered to be uh, second class to those other shows, mm -hmm. uh, which is which has now changed. Thank, thankfully, thanks to streaming, I believe our show, um, thanks to programs like this, the Seventh Rule, um, uh, people have a great appreciation for the work we did, but it took 30 years for people to appreciate. Mm -hmm. It took it took Sarat to grow up into a, a wonderful young man. Oh, <laughs> uh, well. You still I, get called a young man. That's that's a good deal. Uh, yeah, thank you, Armin. <laughs> uh, Armin. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the Sarat behind uh, Ryan. Oh, now. That's okay. What a relief. <laughs> Uh, before you go, uh, Armin, I did want to ask you very quickly about makeup, which is probably a very tired conversation, but uh, Odo's makeup very clearly and obviously was yeah. changed uh, somewhere down the line. It's it's always, it's well documented, but I also noticed a change in your makeup. Quark looked a little bit different. It's subtle. And I wonder if- In the first were, episode? Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if there yeah. are conversations right. about it or if you remember any kind of changes. No, there was a change, and, and the reason was, we were talking about the sets being completed, but my makeup wasn't. <laughs> and I believe, uh, I believe if I have it right, don't quote me, and uh, it, it's that I believe in the first episode, I was wearing a non-quark nose. Um, yeah, it was the nose. And That's so, what it looked and, like. And, and right the in the area kind of around it, yeah. Around the cheekbones. Yeah, and uh, so that that was finally finished by the second episode and so mm. that first episode the makeup is not correct and because there's, there's pictures from the the day we did publicity before the show actually started to film if you, you remember that picture with all of us rock we're standing there mm -hmm. and we all look like deer in the headlights because this is the first time we've seen the press and well, what the <laughs> fuck is this? um yeah and, and yeah. i remember that that's not my makeup either They're, i'm looking at this it's just not my makeup and, and if i may very quickly i it's probably not important. But one of the things that made my character's makeup uh, better, outstanding, is a little liberty that my makeup artist, Karen Westerfield, um, uh, did. If you look at, look, yes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, look at the red underneath my eyes, and it actually mm -hmm. goes all the way around. It's hard in that mm -hmm. picture to do, but it goes all the way around my eyes. And Karen, on her first day of work, decided to do that. Um, and then when her boss, Michael West, Westerfield, no, what Westmore, Westmore, Westmore. Westmoreland, no, West, Westmore, sorry, sorry, sorry. When, uh, when Michael Westmore saw that, when her boss saw what she had done uh, on her own uh, initiative, he was furious. I remember him storming into the trailer and said, what did you oh, do? Wow. And, um, and she said, well, I, I thought it would make his blue eyes stand out better, which it did. And, uh, 
And so because we had already shot it that way for several days, oh. um, it was too late. You couldn't change it. And I am grateful, very mm-hmm. grateful for Karen's initiative because it did make my eyes stand out. And, and with all that makeup on, the only thing you have as an actor, for me anyway, to to convey things to an audience is through the eyes mm-hmm. and, and through the, uh, the, the specifics that you have about the way you say the lines. Mm-hmm. Your eyes and your voice. Well, I mean, uh, none, of this, none of this is available. Not, not, yeah. None of this is available to use because it's all covered. It's all plastic. Even so, something as simple as eyebrows and ex- expressions. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can't do it. So uh, it, it, it was incumbent to, you know, to have. So that. they kept the highlights under the around the eyes for the rest of the show. Yeah, she, they couldn't change it because we had set it up. Um, and uh, but she got into uh, a little bit of trouble. Hot water. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, I was going to make a bad joke. Glad I didn't. Um, Ah, screw it. It's because that first day it looked like this. There was just too much eye makeup, (laughs) Armin. That's what the problem was. No, that's Robert Smith of The Cure. Everybody knows. Um, But thank you, Armin. I didn't have to wear makeup. I didn't have to wear lipstick. uh, But um, (laughs) speaking of makeup, very quickly, and you talked about Renee. For the first three years of the show, because Renee's makeup came all the way down to his lips, mine didn't, but but came down to his lips. Um, During lunch, he couldn't eat anything that would require him to chew. So he had yogurt for three years running um, for lunch because he could sort of sit yogurt. He could sort of spoon that in because if he if he ate something that were the masticated where he had to chew, uh, uh, it would break up the makeup. So he was a dutiful actor and he didn't break up the, the makeup. After three years, he said, the hell with this, I'm going to have lunch. And, uh, <laughs> and then, wow. <laughs> the show's still going wow. on. All right. Never mind. I'm eating. <laughs> I'm eating. <laughs> well, uh, Armin, this has Please. been so cool. We hope to have you again sometime. And you know, you we will. really, will. what a relief. Yeah. You know, we really you know, love we having you and we you. truly appreciate yeah. you. It, it's great fun. And it's, uh, you guys are terrific. And uh, uh, I love being with you on the screen. I prefer being with you in person. But uh, if I can't be with you in person, it, this is a nice way to share. Mm-hmm. And Let's our make love it to Kitty too, as well. Yeah, please give my love to her. Mm-hmm. I will. I will. I will. She's out. She's finally gotten out after being sick. For, for oh, weeks. I bet that's got to feel great. Finally. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Stick around. We've got a couple more segments to go. Uh, what? A couple more segments? We're spoiling you. Uh, we'll uh, see you on the other side, Armin. Thank you so much, and we'll be right back. Oh wait. Speaking of spoiling people. Let's give a very special thanks to Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Seagull, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, T.J. Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin, Titus Muller, Darlena Marie, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anna Post, Rex A. Wood, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Gu, DQ, Neil Akasaka, Justine Norton Kurtzen, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Fultz, my live from Tokyo, Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Jane Jorgensen, and of course, Dr. Susan V. Gruner. We'll be right back on The Seventh Rule. 